Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kit, and what I want to talk about today is how we need to change our mindset in IT. And I wanted to structure this conversation around this question of who feeds Paris. It's a question that was asked by Charles Whelan in his 2002 book, Naked Economics. And what he means is essentially that there is a city, let's see, do it. next one here, there we go. There's a city called Paris, and it has millions of people in it, right? And these people all need to eat multiple times a day. How is it that they're all able to get the food that they need in the right places in the city? Not only that, but exactly what they want as well. Specifically, Whelan states, somehow, the right amount of fresh tuna makes its way from a fishing fleet in the South Pacific to the restaurants on the Rue de Rivoli. Somehow, a neighborhood fruit vendor has exactly what his customers want every morning, from coffee to fresh papayas, even though these things may have come from 10 or 15 different countries. And when you think about it, it really is mind-boggling, right? It's like, how does this possibly work? No individual, no central agency, no government can possibly plan all this, can possibly manage it all. Right? And we know how it works. It's a free market economy that does it. As a matter of fact, history has shown us that centrally planned governments don't work, that they fundamentally fail at doing this. So it's clear the free market is superior in this way to central planned economies. But if central planning, if it is so obvious that central planning isn't ideal and doesn't work, why is it that IT is still run using central planning? The reality today is that if you go and interact with IT, it's essentially like taking a number and getting in line. You have to fill out a bunch of paperwork. You have to justify why it is you're trying to do whatever you're doing. You have to do some negotiations and haggling to figure out exactly what resources you can get. A lot of preparation goes into it, a lot of planning. Months go by, maybe a year goes by, and then you finally get whatever it is that you wanted provisioned, and that service is up and running. Now, it's obviously bad for business, right? We'd like to be able to move faster as a business to be able to produce whatever services we have faster. So this is the problem. But IT is doing it for a reason. IT is doing it to have control and actually to make the data center work. I mean, think about it. If you let users just walk into the data center and go wild, adding in their own servers, they'd be tripping over cables. They'd be unplugging their own cores. They'd be probably setting stuff on fire. Who knows, right? It'd be complete chaos. So IT has good reasons for doing this. They have good reasons for implementing this type of control and trying to bottleneck the system so that the data center doesn't fall over. But it obviously has very bad consequences as well because it means the business can't move as quickly as it should. So we have an opportunity now to actually address this. And that opportunity comes in the form of self-service, self-service cloud. Self-service is essentially like a free market economy. It's an individual who wants to go and do something. They don't need to justify it to anyone. They don't need to get permission. All they need to do is go and seek out whatever service it is they want and figure out if that price is worth paying for whatever they want to do. So it's completely up to them to make, or in the case of an employee, maybe that person and, say, his manager. So we have many examples of self-service in the real world, right? So I took the example of FedEx. FedEx, I can go to their website. I can tell them where I want to ship my package, how much it weighs, and when I want it there. And FedEx will give me a price. I make a determination, does that price makes sense for me, is it worthwhile to do whatever it is or wherever I want to send it? Assuming it is, there is a whole crazy machine in the back here that, that ships my package all the way to its destination, gets it there on time, optimizes for not making left turns, so on and so forth. But I don't care about all this machinery. All I care about is the SLA that FedEx gives me. I want my package to get there when I say it should. And this is FedEx's job to ensure that. So this is what we want for IT. So how do we get there? Well, the key is to start off with the basic building blocks. And that is what we have today, our physical data center, compute, storage, networking. The first ingredient on our way to self-service is to virtualize all those. Many of you probably virtualize your compute today, but you probably haven't gotten that far along with network and storage virtualization. But once you have all of your resources virtualized, they're now software abstractions. It means you can control them in software. There's an API. You can script against them, do whatever you want. And so we can add on a level of automation on top of that that can very quickly spin up new VMs, configure networks, configure storage, connect them all together. You also want some level of policy. Policy specifies what you can and can't do as a user within this system. And then the final thing, is a self-service interface. This is a place like the FedEx website where I go to actually go and provision services. So as a user, 
Let's say that in this case, IT set up a few different services. As a user, I can come in and select one of those services. I can see the price for that service, and I can ask myself a, a question. Does it make sense for me? I don't need to talk to anyone within IT. I can just go and do it myself, assuming that the cost makes sense. So I click a button, and that thing will be provisioned, and I get it. So this is great, right? These are the building blocks we have here. But there's something else that's needed, because it's not just about the technology to get us to a self-service data center. It's really about a mindset change as well. So the way IT works today is that a request comes in, and they take that request, they look at it, they figure out what needs to be done, and then they'll go and provision resources for that request, many times months or, as I said, even a year after the initial request comes in. Obviously, this is the lag time that we have a problem with, right? And so the way to think about it, the big change in mindset that we need is actually to switch these things around. So that you provision capacity before the request comes in, and then you can handle requests on an ongoing basis. This is the way FedEx works, right? I mean, think about FedEx. Think about going to FedEx and dropping off a box, and the guy there being like, nope, sorry, trucks are full, can't ship your package, come back in a couple of weeks. I mean, just think about that. How ridiculous would that be? Would you ever go back? Yeah, it happens all the time within IT, right? But it actually is a testament to FedEx and UPS and others in this space that we have this assumption that they, barring you know, some superstorm, they'll always be able to ship our package and get it there on time. They have truly internalized a self-service model. And that's what we need to do with an IT as well. Now, I know what you may be asking. Isn't this going to lead to total chaos? I mean, this is exactly why we added all these processes to IT in the first place, which is to try and avoid these sorts of problems, right? And now it looks like we're heading right back into it. Well, let's look back at Paris. Is Paris total chaos? I mean, this is a city where free market, self-service, right? All the same properties that we're after. Is it chaotic? Not really, right? I mean, this is some of the best restaurants, some of the best art, some of the best industries in the world in this city. Far from being chaotic, it's at the pinnacle of human civilization, right? The Western industrialized world. And the reason they can do this is not because they have total control of everything that happens within that city, but because they have the right sort of control. So if you want to open a restaurant, if you want to get a liquor license, if you want to change the exterior of a building, you need to go to the government and say, can I have a permit for this? And assuming that your plans match up with what they like, then you'll get it. But if you want to change the menu at your restaurant or change the interior of a building, these are things that don't require any, any permits. You can just go and do it. And so what the government is trying to find is that fine line between ensuring order, ensuring civility, while at the same time allowing individuals to go off and innovate, to go off and do things at their own speed, not being hampered by the government. And so this is what we can do with IT, too. This is the opportunity that we have. If we go back to this, these building blocks I showed earlier, let's focus on the management layer, because really it's all about management to make this a reality. So within the management space, we have something that we call governance. And we use the term governance exactly like a city government with Paris. This is how you can govern the actions of the users within that system. The policy here can specify what users can provision what services and where, where they can move those services, how long those services can live, what networks they can connect to, what storage devices they can use, how much storage they can use, what sort of SLA they're getting from the storage, so on and so forth. These are the knobs that IT has and can control and let the users go off and create virtual data centers within which they can play. <clears throat> and the reality is that virtual data centers, these are safer. These are not the physical data centers that you have, all this chaos, people tripping over cords and so forth. In a virtual data center, there are no cords to trip over. You can't pull out the wrong cable. You can set, you can set these policies to ensure that users abide by the rules of the, of the system that you have. But not, it's not just about governance. It's also about ongoing management of this thing. So for instance, in a city, you know, let's say the Colberts are moving in, the Colbert family's moving into Paris. Do they go and build a house specifically for our family? It's like, no, of course not. That's what IT does today, though. A request comes in, they go build those specific services and provision resources for that request. Instead, what cities do is they look at the total amount of housing they have, how fast it's growing, and then look at how many people are immigrating into the city. Do those two numbers match up? Are we growing housing fast enough? 
These are the same questions you'll want to ask within your data center. And management tools can give you these. They can analyze the, the usage trends. They can tell you how fast aggregate utilization is growing. They can also tell you how many days you have before you'll run out of capacity, either with compute or with networking or what have you, and can tell you how much more you need to buy to ensure that you stay ahead of the curve. And that's that mental shift. That's how we can provision resources before that request comes in. And at VMware, we've actually been thinking about this for quite a while. You may know us just as a server virtualization company, but over the past few years, we've been building out a number of other capabilities, first of which being storage and network virtualization, but most importantly for this talk, management tools as well. As I said, the management tools are what give you the ability to have control, the right sort of control, within the self-service data center. So our products like vCloud Automation Center give you that self-service portal, give you the automation layer, give you the policy engine. Tools like vCenter Operations Management Suite give you that operational control, can do capacity analysis and capacity trending. This is the way you need to start looking at things, again, in the aggregate, not one-offs. You can't manage one-offs in a scalable fashion. And again, this is about technology, but it's more importantly for this discussion about a mindset change. You have the technology tools at your disposal, but now what you need is a mindset change to really make them successful. The reality is that IT needs to get out of the business of being consumed by what's on the menu at each restaurant. That's not scalable. That slows things down. Instead, what IT needs to be focused on is making sure the roads are in good working condition, making sure the electricity stays on, making sure the plumbing works. If you can do this, you will build an infrastructure that your users can take and run with. They can innovate. They can go as quickly as they want to. And that's exactly the point here. So if we internalize this mindset, we can get back to the original question that we started off this talk with. So who feeds Paris? The right answer is to let Paris feed itself. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.